um, station data. Uh, and that data has also been turned into fluxes. And then I won't talk very much, but this is a very common tool both in the observational synthesis side and the modeling side is the World Ocean uh, Data Atlas. This is the product that's put together originally by Sid Levitas uh, by, the, by a NOAA group uh, and is, has uh, basically the, probably the best, most consistent compilation of temperature, salinity, nutrients, oxygen. Uh, and this is a fairly standard data product. Um, you guys had a talk by Reiner Schlitzer the other day. Yeah, so this is one of the standard data sets that's embedded in, in, in Reiner's work. There are also a number of data sets that are, are underway. So for example, um, Carina is a North Atlantic project. There's now a group of North Pacific nations under Pisces, which are doing the same thing for the North Pacific. Um, I, Bob says they're expected in about a year and a half. Uh, Lou Cotaspati is working on Ar Arctic nutrients, trying to pull together data sets from um, the Scandinavians, Russians, US, Canadians. Uh, SOCAT um, is a international attempt um, being coordinated by the IOCCP to try to pull together PCO2 data. Taro's been doing this um, as a personal project for a long time based on his personal relationships with people. This is now attempted to be institutionalized so that this can carry on for an extended period of time um, to pull together. This would be surface PCO2 data. And then uh, there, is pl there are plans for a second version of GLODAP, which is going to be merging the first version with the Carina effort, Pisces, other long-term data sets. Uh, this would also um, fold in the Clivar CO, the, repeat, the new Clivar repeat CO2 hydrography lines as they're being produced. So that got repeated. <coughs> Excuse me. So wh why there's a lot of effort that goes into this. Um, you know, Bob would be the first one to say that it's not a simple task of just oh. You know, Chris has a data set, Joni has a data set, we'll just pull those together and, and publish them. It should take a week. Um, instead, it takes people years to do this. Uh, so why would you put in all this effort? Well, one of the obvious ones that you guys have been looking at a lot this week is a lot of the problems associated with carbon cycle and um, ocean acidification are basin and global scale wide. And no single investigator, even no nation, can pull together that data set on their own. These are all international data sets. If you're going to look at basin scale, you really need to pull data from different countries, from different programs. And if you're going to use that data, you really need to focus both on the precision of the data, you know, how good is the data internal to a particular data set, but you need to know something about the accuracy of the data. And you need to be able to relate different people's data. So there are you know, let's say for the North Pacific, there are five Japanese cruises, three Australian cruises, a Canadian cruise, and five American cruises. You have to be able to bring that together in a consistent way in order to really understand what the patterns are uh, at any particular time, but also how are you going to make comparisons from, say, the data we measured in the 1990s to the data we measure 2020, if we want to look at trends. Uh, we really have to focus a lot on the actual accuracy of the data if we're going to detect long-term trends. And so a lot of the work is going into figuring out how to do those, how to maintain uh, consistent data records over long extended periods of time. Um, and that's the, the, this, you know, Bob's argument about climate change science requires accurate data. Um, and then of course, you know, these data sets, and I showed a little bit of this yesterday and I'll show more tomorrow, are crucial for validating um, and testing numerical models. Very few numerical models, particularly at the global scale, go and start picking apart individual cruise data. Often they are compared against climatologies and so, uh, or, or, or um, these large synthetic data sets. 
And so those are really the, the primary tools for the communication between the community that's making observations in the field and the community that's doing synthesis and modeling is through these synthetic data sets. Uh, because none of the modeling groups want to go and, and start fresh looking at all the raw data, dealing with all these issues of accuracy uh, and intercomparison between data sets. And so these data products really are the primary link between those two groups. So how do you do this? And it's a fairly painstaking, and, I, and I've watched Bob do this for a number of years, so I, I can say this, though I don't do a lot of this myself. It's a fairly painstaking process. You know, the first step, particularly when we're thinking internationally, is to figure out who has what data. Um, and you'd be surprising how hard it is uh, to go back and figure out what cruises were done where, who has the data, who's responsible for the data. Uh, and the IOCCP, which is based in UNESCO, has done a very good job of trying to keep track of uh, sort of current and planned um, data sets that are being collected. So for example, the repeat hydrography under Clivar, you know, who's going to do what when. But when you look back in time, sometimes it's pretty hard. A lot of, some of this data, for example, the data that Lou Cotaspati is pulling together for the Arctic, some of this is still in notebooks. Um, it's, or it's on, you know, you know the, the nutrient data is on somebody's computer printout tape sitting up on a, on a shelf somewhere. And so the first step is to go out and figure out, you know, what, what the data is out there. Um, the metadata, you know, what cruise was it on? You know, were there methods published? W where are the ancillary data? Uh, for example, the temperature and salinity, the hydro, you know, the hydro hydrographic data. Uh, tracking down what the right links are to that data set. And metadata, I know Cindy will talk tomorrow, um, metadata, metadata, metadata. It is crucial. Otherwise, it's just a, a collection of, of quasi-random numbers. If you don't have the metadata to describe how it was measured, who measured it, where it was measured, and you don't keep the, pro the Provence of the data, um, it, it really becomes useless over time. So often the... Um, the, the first step is to then, once you've got the data, the metadata, is to put the data into a consistent format so you can compare between different cruises. Um, there are now attempts, and Cindy will talk about this a little tomorrow, uh, to have standardized data formats. So for example, in the WOS era for hyd hydrographic cruises, there were standard data formats where cruises from all the different countries were released in one format that could be internally consistent and people could build machinery to access anybody's data. Uh, and usually the uh, initial principal investigator does a primary quality control. So for example, on the WOS lines and the repeat Clivar hydrography lines, um, before we get off the ship, we've done the, the uh, primary control, precision control, to flag bad data, flag questionable data. Once we've done uh, calibrations back on shore, we then flag the data, uh, go back through and reflag the data to mark which data sets we think, you know, which data points we think are questionable. But those are usually done internally to a cruise and with comparison to historical data. The next step when you have multiple cruises is to do secondary quality control. And as Bob says here, you're really looking for systematic measurement error. You know, precision is you know, how well you can, I know you guys have probably always already seen this, but, you know, let's say you had a, you know, your truth was here. You know, precision is, is the range of points. You know, this might be a data set that's not very precise. You might have another one that's very precise. It's sort of the spread of your data. But accuracy is, I could have a very precise data set, right? that is very far away from truth. This would have high precision, but low accuracy. And these get mixed up a lot in the scientific literature. People aren't careful when they're talking about what they mean by data quality. And for this kind of effort, this, this accuracy is really important because if there are systematic offsets or biases, when you start to compare across space between different cruises or across time, uh, you basically, you lose a lot of the rationale or a lot of the information that you're looking for. Um, 
And then, you know, th th there's work to be done afterwards, the public release of the individual data, f data files, the public release of any synthetic products. A number of these climatologies are producing not just, not just the data sets themselves, uh, but they will release uh, data offsets. So as part of the secondary quality control, they'll make recommendations for offsets of the data to try to adjust for systematic biases. And then they often are producing synthetic products. So going from individual transects to gridded products that people can use as part of their research. So let's talk a little bit more about the secondary quality control because this is probably the place. A lot of the other things on that list are rather mechanical. They're difficult, you know, to pull together the metadata. But in terms of where you're making scientific judgments, it's often in the assessment of the secondary quality control and the adjustments, the recommended adjustments. So for a lot of open ocean sites, the the initial assumption is that the abyssal waters, somewhere in your, in your cruise, you, in your open ocean cruise, you've measured someplace in the deep ocean that you assume is relatively constant with time. So you have, if you want, a built-in uh, secondary reference standard by saying, well, the deep North Pacific has not evolved um, between the six months that one line measured east-west and another line measured north-south. And it gives you a way of intercomparing between cruises. Um, this is not always true, particularly when you're looking at long time series or in places where you have variability that penetrates all the way to the bottom. So if you think about uh, what was talked about earlier this week, if you look at the anthropogenic CO2 distributions, there are places in the North Atlantic and in the Southern Ocean that have CO2 penetrating all the way to the bottom. So you're going to have to make some decisions about if you're comparing data sets that are separated in time, how do you make those comparisons? Because this sort of first guess uh, won't hold. This is one of the reasons why for the, the repeat hydrography programs, we want to do whole basins uh, as synoptically as possible so that we can, this assumption likely holds and we can do the secondary quality control. So rather than doing random lines you know, rather than doing a biological experiment where we would randomize the collection of the data, we really want to systematically collect data by basin so that we can do this quality control issue. Um, often the data bi bias is assumed to either be additive or multiplicative, so it's either a, a bias, so it's an offset, or, you know, say for nutrients, you say that you, you basically didn't have your calibration slope correct, corrected and you would multiply all the nutrients by a factor, you know, 1.05 or something like that. There are a number of ways to quantify bias. Um, the first is a crossover comparison, and I'll show some examples of that, where you're looking at where hydrographic transects cross and trying to pull all the data from a subregion where you think water properties are relatively uniform. Um, you can do this through data inversion. Um, which is basically pulling in an inversion model and seeing what's consistent between the model, uh, where, where you get inconsistencies. I'll talk a little bit about the multiple linear regression residual analysis. Did you guys talk, did Chris or anybody talk about MLR methods? No. Nope. Okay, so I'll briefly introduce MLR methods. I don't have a lot of slides, but I can talk about that. Uh, surface trend analysis uh, is basically plotting data uh, the, the crossover is for points that are very closely geographically located. MLR can be for a larger region. Um, and surface trend analysis, for example, on an isopycnal surface can also be on a larger region where the data don't necessarily need to be co-located, but you're looking to see if you map one data set onto a, onto a surface, objectively analyze it, you map another data set onto an object, onto uh, the surface, how do those, how do those differ and change? And then uh, internal, internal consistency calculations for the carbon cycle, looking at different components, say if you measured, if you measured dissolved inorganic carbon, alkalinity, and discrete PCO2 in subsurface waters and pH, right, you only need two of those four to define 
all the other components. So you can start comparing. Are your pHs, are the pHs you measured consistent with the pHs that you quant or estimate or calculate from dissolved inorganic carbon and alkalinity? Now, of course, this raises issues of the quality of the thermodynamic data, and there's been lots of discussions about what are the best thermodynamic constants to use. Um, but this is an important internal consistency check when you have multiple components of, seawater, of the seawater carbonate chemistry measured. Um, and this is the last one. No matter how much this gets put into nice mathematical terms, makes it look very objective, very automated, in the end it's a subjective, um, it's a subjective decision by the people who are putting together uh, doing the secondary quality control as to what the offset should be. So this is, for example, this is out of Lam a paper by Lam et al. Um, in deep sea research from a few years ago, where th this was the WOS uh, data set for the uh, CO2. These are all the lines labeled, so they're the, the WOS uh, notation where the lines were given uh, P for Pacific and then a number. So P16N was the northern part of that leg, uh, et cetera. Uh, and what was done, the first step was to look at crossover analyses. So each one of these points where you have lines that cross, each one of these circles is a potential spot for a crossover analysis intercomparing two cruises. And ideally what you would like is you'd like any particular line, I mean this line is great because it has many crossover points, um, but you'd like any particular line to have several crossover points with other cruises so you can not just look at how one cruise compares to another, but how you fit together the entire basin. So one of the things that's done um, is to look in the deep waters where you think things are fairly stable. Uh, this is, for example, for stations near uh, 30 north, 152 west. Um, this is dissolved inorganic carbon plotted against, um, this is sigma 3, so density reference to 3,000 meters. So you look against deep density surfaces. Um, you don't want to do depth because there can be short-term variations in the depth of isopycnals, and that'll just throw you, there, there's no reason to fold that complication in. So to get around that, you do it in, in either neutral space or isopycnal space, a reference to a deep, isop, uh, deep pressure surface. Uh, and these are two cruises. And what you see is that there's similar shape. Uh, these are the data and then a fit of a polynomial. There's a similar shape uh, to these, the data from these two cruises of DIC versus uh, isop, uh, uh, versus density, excuse me, <coughs> um, but there's an offset. And there's particularly an offset in the, in the deep waters. And this might be telling you that one of these cruises is either too high or too low relative to another. Um, and there's a variety of different ways of doing this. Usually you want to do not just pick a single depth or pressure, or excuse me, density surface, but look across a wide range so you can really see um, you know, what the bias is uh, over, over a, a number of data points. This is another example um, where they fit uh, polynomial surfaces and are actually comparing these polynomial fits between the two different cruises to see if they can assess what the bias is. Another way that can be done not just for crossovers but for larger basin scales is to do MLR analysis or multiple multilinear regression. Um, I didn't get to finish this slide this morning, but I'll just all. So the idea is that um, you have you can relate dissolved inorganic carbon to other biological and chemical factors. Um, it makes sense that depending upon the where the water mass was formed, it might have particular characteristics for dissolved inorganic carbon. And then as you change, uh, as you add organic matter and you have respiration of organic matter at depth, you're going to be adding nutrients, removing oxygen. 
And so it's been observed that you can fit dissolved inorganic carbon fairly well against, say, a collection of nutrients, nitrate, AOU, so oxygen utilization, silicate, salinity. You might have a few other terms in here. <coughs> You could do that for a particular cruise. You could find how the data compares to um, what, what the fit of the MLR is. You could then take these coefficients and apply that to another data set. So I could take these coefficients A, B, C, D, E, and F, which have been derived from cruise one. I can then take those and apply those coefficients to the hydrographic data, the nutrient salinity and oxygen data from cruise two from the same region. And then that would give me an estimated dissolved inorganic carbon. And I can compare that estimated dissolved inorganic carbon against the actual observations on cruise two. And I can see if there's an offset. The idea here is that there are systematic variations in dissolved inorganic carbon in the deep water. But those systematic variations in space are characteristic of water mass distributions. So even if the cruises don't, uh, don't overlap exactly in space, they're sampling the same broad water mass distributions. And so the MLR gives me a way of intercomparing those two without focusing just on the crossover points. You're really looking at what are the property-property relationships between those two cruises, and are they consistent? or do they suggest that there should be an offset? Now, of course, the problem is, before when we were looking at just crossovers, we were dealing just with the quality of the DIC data. Now, you, you, you basically need to also assess the quality of all these other data sets. You know, you can't do MLR if you don't think the nitrates are, you know, if there's offsets in the nitrates between the two data sets, all you're doing is folding one error from the error from nitrate into the error for DIC. So you need to be a little careful about that. Uh, but these methods are being used a lot, not just for this kind of secondary quality control. You can also use this as a way of estimating the buildup of anthropogenic CO2 with time. So if I were to do the same thing, I could do this analysis for data collected, say, 10 years ago along a line, go back 10 years, you know, go take data from the 1990s, do an MLR, come back, do the same transect, you know, yes, water masses will have shifted a little bit with time. There'll be some sloshing of water, but I can compare the, this property-property relationship to see if does, how much anthropogenic CO2 is built up by looking at the difference between the MLRs between the two time periods. So that was a, one of the ways this data set, this approach has been, this MLR approach is being used beyond just quality control. So what is often generated is um, these are a variety of different approaches. You know, isopictal analysis, crossover MLR, um, different types of crossover, inter internal consistency between DIC and pH. Um, this is from the LAM paper. You know, they looked at five or six different measures of systematic bias and then plotted those for all the cruises on the data set. And so some of them, for example, this cruise, which is P2, you know, you have six different methods, all of which are suggesting that the alkalinity tends to be biased. Uh, other ones, it's not always clear. You know, some of them, they sort of scatter about zero. So don't just depend upon a single approach. You really want to look at multiple approaches. And from this, you might come up with you know, this data set might need to be corrected. Uh, this data set might need to be corrected. You subjectively have to make some decisions about what the correct uh, offset adjustments that need to be made. So let's talk a little bit. So that's sort of some of the procedure. Let's talk about some of the data sets. Uh, so this is the GLODAP data set, um, the Global Ocean Data Analysis Project. You can read there, it was a collaborative effort to estimate the global ocean anthropogenic CO2 distribution and in inventory. So lots of work was done on other things besides DIC because you needed those data sets to estimate anthropogenic CO2 
using one of these empirical techniques, such as the, 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 the Gruber method, which requires information on you know, correction of the data for calcification and remineralization, correction of the data for organic matter remineralization, and some estimate of time. So you need to be able to correct for the approximate age of the water mass. Um, it folded in data from WOS and JGOFs, uh, OASES, which is actually the NOAA project that was run in conjunction with WOS, uh, SAVE, which was the South Atlantic Ventilation Experiment, which was uh, right about the beginning of the WOS period, and then lots of other smaller projects. Uh, here's the distribution of sections. So uh, these are, you know, the Pacific is basically a lot of the WOS, the, the WOS era sections along with some scattering of other data sets. You can tell the WOS lines because they basically show up as solid, almost straight lines, other people's cruises um, that, that weren't run with the, the WOS constraints. For example, this is some of the Equatorial Pacific data from NOAA. Um, North Atlantic has uh, both WOS era data and, and lots of European and US data. Atlantic is very well covered, uh, and also the Indian Ocean. And this is just to give you the, the kind of density of data sets. Um, here's the, the link. If you just, if you just Google GLODAP, you will, you'll, you'll find this. It's, it's on the CDAC page now. Um, or if you just go over to CDAC, Alex is going to be talking about about CDAC in a little more detail. Um, but they have a fairly nice description, you know, what the project is, some of the results. Um, there's an atlas so you can actually go and pull off individual cruises uh, if you want to pull off or, or data. Uh, and then there's also data and data visualization tools. There's a live access server so you can actually subsample, uh, subsample and collect data so you don't have to download all of it at the same time. So what's available in GLODAP? So they did the analysis. They, it, because of the way the quality control is done, you want to do the quality control on as large a chunk of the data as you can. They broke it up into basins uh, and did the quality control separately for the three basins. Um, and so you have three calibrated data sets one for the Pacific, Atlantic, and Indian. And these are actually the, um, the, the section bottle data. So you can go back and collect individual bottles, uh, but they've been calibrated. Adjustments have been made to the data. So it's not the raw data that you would get if you went over to the US Clivar hydrography website or the WOS hydrography website. They've also taken that those bottle data, those section data. So you have data along sections. Um, and then they've made objectively, uh, done an objective analysis, optimal interpolation, and created a gridded product for the globe um, from, the, from this data set. So this would be the, ca the corrected, calibrated bottle data. And then you would have global fields, three-dimensional three fields for the carbon parameters and these other tracers. So for example, they have nutrients, oxygen, temperature, salinity. Um, these, what, what's in here are things like radiocarbon and freons, anthropogenic CO2. Um, they didn't do the nutrient, oxygen, temperature, and salinity um, because these are already in the WOS, the, 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 excuse me, the, uh, NO, the NODC Levitas data set, the World Ocean Atlas. But you could, what people often do is they combine the GLODAP data for the carbon parameters and tracers with the World Ocean Atlas for oxygen and hydrography and nutrients. That's what we use to initialize our models and also to evaluate our model performance. So this is a pretty long list. I'm not going to go through all this, but it'll be in the, in the, the presentation. Uh, but you know, lots of things have been done with this GLODAP data. You know, um, you can come up with global inventories and distributions for, you know, DIC alkalinity, but also the freons. Um, 
radiocarbon, bomb radiocarbon, these are the tracers that are used to help calibrate the time scales for anthropogenic CO2. Um, anthropogenic CO2, this was the data set that was used to put together the Sabine et al. paper that came out in Science, which is sort of the, the summary synthesis paper for the WOS era of here's how much anthropogenic CO2 is in the ocean, and here's the distribution. The GLODAP effort was basically all the hard work to pull all together the global data sets to do that. And then people have done lots of other things. Model, um, you know, model initialization, air-sea gas exchange, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the things that is in there is you will be able to go back and see if there are correction factors. Uh, if you want to, if you want to, and this is very important, is just because you've produced this calibrated data set once doesn't mean that we need to get rid of the raw data, that we're done. Somebody might come back later on and decide to do the calibration in a different way. Uh, so the raw data should still be kept, and then you need to publish your calibration factors. So this is by Cruz. So for P17 North, um, this is, the, you know, codes, etc. cetera. Um, this is, there, there's a whole collection of suggested corrections. And if you go to the web page, it talks about, you know, how to apply these corrections. But for TCO2 or dissolved inorganic carbon, a minus seven, which is actually a fairly big number. So when they, they had to make some, based on those secondary quality controls, this cruise is they were actually suggesting a fairly large adjustment for both DIC and alkalinity. Um, but you get down to, what is this, this is P6. Uh, this is actually very small adjustments. And so some of the data sets, some of the transects had to be adjusted fairly substantially in order to fit within this basin scale quality control. Um, I just wanted to show the, um, what some of these global maps look like. These are dissolved inorganic carb, or excuse me, this is, um, I think this is alkalinity and this is dissolved inorganic carbon. Um, these are from the global 3D uh, objectively analyzed fields. And like any objectively analyzed product, you know, you can uh, argue about the details uh, but these are very useful synthetic products. Um, and to be honest, most of the modeling groups and a lot of the data synthesis groups are using these 3D fields rather than using the calibrated, the calibrated cruise data to do their model data comparisons. And so there are also a whole series of um, assumptions and, and judgments that go from going from those transect data into a three-dimensional objectively analyzed field. One of the nice things about the objective analysis is you can also estimate uh, <coughs> error fields. Uh, this is for alkalinity. It's for one particular depth. And basically, you start to see where the cruise lines are and where they're not. So typically, low error in the places where you have, where you have observations, and then regions where you tend to build up higher error. So one of the nice things is not just knowing what the estimated climatology is, but where can you actually believe it? What is the error? Remember I showed you the plot the other day where I was talking about you know, comparing models to observations and you need to have a sense for how big the observational error is? Well, this is one way for intercomparing these products. This is one estimate of, of the error that you can use to assess the, the quality of the product. Um, there are problems, of course. Um, the, the using additive nutrient adjustments resulted in some negative values for nutrients near the surface. So if you just did a, an offset, if your deep nutrients suggested that you were too high and you do a negative bias, um, in the surface water, which has zero nutrients, you add a negative bias, you get negative nutrients. Which, you know, if you're doing modeling, you know, you sometimes you live with those sorts of errors, but it gets data people a little wigged out when you have, you know, minus one micromolar nitrate. Um, not all, you know, there just wasn't enough manpower to do secondary quality control on all the parameters. Uh, they didn't do the Arctic or marginal seas. So, for example, 
there's no Arctic up here. And as I'll show tomorrow, you know, that affected, for example, the, the Or et al. 2005 paper that talked about ocean acidification. The data set that they had to do calibration, oh, actually I wanted to go one far back. Yeah, there's no Arctic data uh, in this analysis. So in that Or et al. paper, um, they, they didn't have data to really look at the Arctic and make predictions about Arctic acidification. There's been some new data that's been produced and some data sets pulled together and now there's some new predictions for acidification in the Arctic. But not having data sets in a region hinders both the synthesis of the observations but also hinders the modeling efforts for looking at future projections because you can't assess the quality of the model. Um, and shallow water, there really wasn't a lot of work done in shallow water, uh, in part because of the focus of WOS. So Carina is an, uh, mostly an EU project, uh, but there are collaborative efforts with the, with the US. Um, the, it, it started off as a uh, n sort of North Atlantic and Arctic project, but it's also now extended into the South Atlantic and some lines in the Pacific. Um, the, they're adding about 16,000 stations. And basically, a lot of this data um, was sitting on people's shelves, sitting on people's hard drives, had not gotten into uh, the international data climatologies or databases. And you could view this as both a data synthesis, but also a data rescue project. Uh, lots of people involved. And that, this is a statement, this is, you know, these data synthesis, although there may be one or two people who are doing a lot of the working on the computer and doing a lot of the synthesis, in order to pull together all these data sets, in order to have these subjective judgments about offsets, you need to go back and talk to the people who actually made the measurements. Um, you know, what was going on? Do they have any insight into these differences? And so you quickly, you know, here's, um, here's just, a, you know, a list of all the people involved. And so it becomes a very large, large group, lots of institutions. So I won't go through this in detail. You can read this slide. But basically, it's the same sort of view as GLODAP, but focusing on a lot of European data, uh, same sort of goal of trying to integrate data from different cruises and bring it into a consistent format. Um, one of the really nice things about Carina is it brings in a lot of high latitude Arctic data. WOS, the WOS data didn't really penetrate into the Nordic Seas um, and, and the Arctic. So there's lots of subpolar North Atlantic, but also Nordic Seas and, and Arctic data that's really going to make a, a nice addition. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. Is going to make a nice addition. Uh, this is particularly relevant for the ocean acidification crowd. So, for example, we've been using, you know, we got an early look at some of the, the this Arctic data, and it's really helped our modeling looking at ocean acidification in the in the uh, in the Arctic, which is a region which um, may be experiencing uh, undersaturated conditions for the carbonate minerals fairly early earlier than most other parts of the globe. Uh, here's the Atlantic data. So a, a high density in the North Atlantic, and then some Southern data. Um, so it takes a while. That's, I guess, the other thing, is that these efforts are often underfunded or weakly funded. Um, Karina's been going on. There's also social aspects. You have to get people comfortable with working together. They have to be confident that their data is going to be treated fairly and that, that by them offering and volunteering their data, um, that they're part of a collaborative effort and that they will benefit. So one of the things they're trying to do within Karina is have data products. Um, Alex will talk about CDAC, something that is citable so that people get credit for the data that they've contributed. And so you can't just tell people, hey, submit your data now to this effort and we will process it and we will tell the world what the corrections are. 
it has to be a two-way interaction between the groups that are doing the synthesis and the groups that actually collected the data. And the people who collected the data have to see benefit for participating in this. Um, so it started almost a decade ago, actually probably a decade ago by now. Um, and then here's the, the history. There have been a, you know, a series of, uh, uh, of, of meetings, both you know, to get the effort started, but then once the synthesis effort started is to have uh, workshops. So for example, I was at the June 2006 workshop um, where we looked at preliminary results um, and talk to people around the table and then and then actually got observational teams together uh, and a series of targeted workshops to really refine the products for individual regions. Um, so the, the I, I, I didn't get a chance to look and see if the Carina data set is um, you know wh wh where is it on the CDAC data set but um, that's where they're that's where it's going to end up. Oh, and this is an interesting development. There is a new journal. It's an open access journal. It's called Earth System Science Data. And I, I, I should have grabbed a, um, let's see if I can do that tonight. Um, the Earth System Science Data is actually an electronic publication where you can publish a data set or a data synthesis. And so there's relatively minor documentation, you know, it's basically where the data, all the metadata, where the data was collected, what synthesis activities were done on it, what calibration act activities were done on it. Uh, but it gives a single citable reference so that the people who've done all this work can actually get credit. Uh, and then there's links to the data. The data need to be publicly available um, uh, and, and, and in some uh, uh, recognized data set or database in order to go into this journal. But this is a very useful, very important development because it used to be that people would simply release a data report. I have a whole collection of CDAC and NOAA data reports. Um, but this is now in a, journal, in a journal. It has a DOI, so it has a digital uh, object identifier. And it's really trying to give people credit for what they've done and give a way of, of recognizing that and making sure that when people use the data, they're going back to and acknowledging where the data came from. So, um, same sorts of things we've talked about. You know, they did uh, assembly and primary quality control to look at precision. You know, are they in common format? Are they in common units? Um, you know, the, it, it is not unusual to find one nutrient data set in moles per uh, moles per liter, another in moles per kilogram. Uh, sometimes the units are labeled incorrectly, so you have a 2.5% error. Uh, sometimes it's worse. People th think the data is in one, so they correct it to another. So then you have 2.5 times 2.5, so you have a 5% error. Uh, these sort of quality control are relatively straightforward. Then the secondary quality control that we've been talking about uh, and making a set of adjustments uh, recommended adjustments. And again, here's the link to the, to the data set. One of the things that's unique about the Carina data set is they have so much data in the Nordic Seas, and the deep Nordic Seas are not a place that we think is constant with time. There are ventilation events that penetrate all the way to the bottom of the Greenland Sea. And so there, for that data set, for those data sets in those regions, we don't necessarily have a constant baseline that we can intercompare against. And so this is showing the, the before and after a correction. This is uh, for deep oxygen. Um, and what they've actually done is um, these, are the, these are showing trends. There are actually trends in deep oxygen. And so you have to be a little careful when you're doing the analysis. Um, you can't just level all of this data to one time because you actually think some of these trends are real. And so part of the thing that has been done in Carina is to try to figure out how do you, how do you adjust data sets um, to maintain these long-term temporal trends, um, which is 
a, a more difficult problem than the initial assumption of all deep water is the same and we can use that to calibrate. And there's documentation in Carina as to exactly how that's done. Um, so this is the this is after all of the uh, consistency checks. Uh, this is the um, the cleaned up version. So here there's trend, but there's lots of scatter. And by the time you get to um, how things have been cleaned up and intercompared, you actually see uh, a much clearer trend line because the data's all been brought together and is internally consistent. And I have to admit, I haven't looked carefully at exactly how this was done, um, but I do think it's important to note that, that the, these sorts of, including this sort of temporal variability, um, makes, the, makes the secondary QC a little bit more difficult but it's very important to do. Uh, similarly, Bob has a list of science hi scientific highlights. You can go in and, and read that, but it's basically the argument that, you know, once you generate these data sets, there's lots of things you can do with them because they're basin scale, they're internally consistent. You know, you can start re-estimating um, with much better quality the, the amount of anthropogenic carbon, which then tells you how much um, acidification has been going on because of human, human behavior. Uh, you can look at the trends in anthropogenic carbon per time. So start looking at inventory changes. Um, and then you can start looking, for example, uh, looking at changes in the inventory between high and low uh, NAO periods. So some of this variability, some of the variability, for example, in the Greenland Sea is associated with shifts between periods of positive phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation and negative phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation. And so by having a data set that's internally consistent over time, you can actually look at the effects of natural climate mode variations on the storage of carbon, both anthropogenic and natural, in the basins. Um, so lessons learned. Um, is Carina really built from GLODAP, so having the machinery and the uh, procedures that had put together had been put together in GLODAP really benefited the Carina effort, um, and they could get started much faster and make faster progress. Uh, certified reference materials are critical. I'm sure Bob, uh, I'm sure Andrew talked about that quite a bit, but the CRMs, these certified reference materials, having those so that you can go back and make comparisons and checks against the certified reference materials is really essential for doing this high quality work, both for precision and accuracy. <coughs> um, let's see, uh, metadata. Um, it, and, and I think one of the points that Bob would make, Cindy would make is it's much easier to do data management properly if you start off and do it from the beginning. And if you have a plan to submit the data set, you know where you're going to submit the data set, you've talked to database managers, it is very hard to do historical archaeology on databases. You know, you know, how are the measurements made? Well, I don't know. It's in some file somewhere that that computer died. Um, going back and trying to recover data is very difficult and having a plan up front where the data is going to be uh, included in the database uh, makes the data set much more useful. Um, and then, you know, I love this, early data release benefits data generators. Um, getting your data sets into these products, they can be cited, they can be used. Um, that's why having things that are citable databases citable journal publications so people can acknowledge and give you credit for the hard work you've done. If the data's sitting on your shelf, nobody knows about it. Uh, even if you publish a paper about it and nobody can access the data, you're not going to get as much recognition as you do if the data is released and released in a way that can be cited. Um, so this talks about what's available, uh, merged calibrated files, for the Arctic, Atlantic, and Southern Ocean. Um, 
metadata that includes a bibliography of papers, so where the data is, you know, papers that relate to where the data has already been reported on, uh, the software for the secondary QC, uh, all the records of how the secondary QC tests were done, and then this <coughs> excuse me, special issue of, the, of this Earth System Science, the ESSD journal article, or special issue. It's going to be several journal articles. Um, yeah. Mm. Um, I, I haven't followed this for a while. I've gone to, for at least the last decade, we've been going to meetings and we've been saying we need some reference standards for nutrients. Um, and I haven't followed it the last couple of years, but this is a perennial plea. Um, I don't know, Chris, do you? you keep up on this at all? No? Okay. Yeah, I, I, I haven't seen any progress, but, you know, I haven't, I, the last Clivar line I did was a few years ago, so. That's fine. I was just curious. Yeah. But it is an important problem, is the nutrients, nutrient, would, the nutrient analyses techniques have really been around since the 60s and 70s, uh, but you still find offsets between data sets. And that's because you just don't have reference materials to be able to intercalibrate easily. Um, so this is just a list. Here's this Earth System Science data. Um, and uh, here's all the papers, 20 papers going through, you know, all the data sets that, go, that have gone into Carina. Um, so a, a wonderful resource um, for using the data. Um, I just wanted to add a little bit, Bob had mentioned at the beginning of his talk, he had mentioned the Takahashi PCO2 data set, which I think is also very relevant for people working in this, in this field. I just wanted to, to, to give you a little bit of background on this. Um, the, um, there's been a new release of this data set. Uh, there was a paper in Deep Sea Research that came out just this year, 2009, and there's now a corrected new data set that has I think going on close to four million data points. These are primarily from underway lines, uh, some on research vessels, a lot on commercial ships of opportunity. Um, I think if I get this right, the, the black were the original data sets that were in um, one of the earlier Takahashi releases, and the red are all the new data that have been added since then for this new release. So. There have been a series of releases by Takahashi. You know, it started with 900,000 points, then 1.5 million. Now it's up to close to 4 million points. Um, but even with 4 million points, you see that there are still some big holes. And so this is showing um, the, the way Taro does this is he puts data into four by five degree boxes. And then he's looked in each one of those boxes and he takes the data and he puts them into months. So how many, how much data is there for all the Januaries, all the Februaries? So if there's a single point in January, a single point in February, single point in March, single point for all, each individual month, they may have occurred in six different cruises over 12, you know, many different years, you would get a, an orange. So that's saying at least you have some sense of the seasonal coverage. Now, of course, you have, you might have many years apart, and you may have to correct for those temporal trends. But you see that along the major shipping routes, so um, you know Tokyo and Yokohama to Long Beach, Seattle, uh, up through the the Bering Sea route into Seattle, you have very good coverage. Uh, the lines from Northern Europe into US and the Caribbean, you have very good coverage. Some in the equatorial region, which is more, uh, some of this is research cruises. But there are large parts of the ocean that even over 30 years of data, um, there may only be a few months that have been measured. So we don't even have a good representation of the seasonal cycle in large parts of the Southern Ocean. The reason I want to emphasize this is the Takahashi data set gets used a lot as 
data. But like any of these synthetic data products, they are really a, a, a synthesis. If you like, it's a, it's a simplified model of the ocean uh, because you have to fill in lots of data in regions where we're still data poor. 